Dear colleagues, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, Simeon Dyankov. Uh, Simeon uh, Dyankov is a famous uh, scholar, but uh, at the same time I would describe him as a um, scholar who also implement his knowledge in practical uh, life, which usually we don't do. Uh, as you know, uh, Simeon uh, was Bulgarian Minister of Finances and he was a Deputy Prime Minister. And after this uh, experience, he returned to academic career. And now he is a rector of New School of Economics, Rossijska Ekonomiska Škola, a famous school. And um, he um, will tell us about his new research project, which uh, is very much intriguing for me and as well as to historians in this room and to economists also. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I was invited today more um, as uh, a rector for the new economic school. Our school and your school are the two preeminent uh, Russian private schools uh, and um, uh, as a rector for the last year or so, uh, some of the issues that we encounter uh, at the new economic school in uh, Moscow, probably your administration also encounters, so I came here to talk mostly to your administration. But then I thought that it's also useful to um, show you some of the directions in which um, I am trying to uh, develop uh, the new economic school in terms of research agenda. And as I would show you, actually, not just the new economic school, but we are actively looking for some um, other people interested in merging, basically, the field of history with economics and coming up with uh, economic history. And in particular, uh, using the very rich uh, tradition in Russia uh, during now several centuries uh, of uh, learning about uh, economics, how markets operate, how institutions develop or underdevelop uh, using data from Russia. So what I would show you is not a research paper, uh, it's actually a compilation of different research papers that uh, over the last few months my uh, professors and uh, some other uh, uh, colleagues as well as many of our students have been involved in doing some uh, uh, some research. So in particular I'll try to convince you why Russian economic history is uh, a very hot area to do research and that it can be quite well uh, published. And then I'll show you four different examples uh, of research papers with uh, their particular findings. Uh, and then summing it up, uh, where I think this research can, uh, can lead us. So since my, I understand there are lots of historians in the rooms, uh, uh, the other people are economists, I don't probably need to convince you why economic history in general is a very um, valuable topic for, um, uh, for study. But why in particular Russian economic history, and by Russian I mean not only Russia as we see it now, but the various versions of the uh, Russian uh, empire going several centuries uh, uh, back, uh, which uh, includes a number of other um, regions, countries, uh, that are now not part of Russia. Um, why this is uh, quite a wealth of uh, data, of information, and of uh, events, political as well as economic events, that one can uh, do quite a lot of interesting research. So what makes it interesting? Well, first, uh, there are several fields within economics, not just economic history, but institutional economics, which is where I've done some of my more recent work, uh, regulatory and legal um, uh, economics, um, the development of um, states, if you, if you like, um, or regions uh, as well that uh, over the last 15, 20 years has become one of the three, four, in my view, most important areas of economics in terms of research and has gotten a few Nobel Prize winners uh, in, the, uh, in the process. So much of the, so far, research on, uh, on um, institutions building has focused on, uh, on empires. Not surprising because 
in an empire you have a lot of data and uh, you typically have quite different uh, cultures within the particular empire, different geographical regions which give you variations in um, uh, both the societies that are there as well as the types of economies that you uh, uh, that you run and also that the statistics are compiled in a, a relatively consistent uh, way so it's not like you're going and collecting country by country uh, statistics. Um, so most of this work is done on the British Empire, on the French Empire, on the Spanish Empire the way that it uh, uh, and when it uh, existed uh, and uh, so far at least in economics not in history Relatively little work has been done using data on, uh, on the various uh, versions of the time of, uh, of the Russian Empire. But the first point is that if you want to study particularly institutional design, but also how markets develop, having a rich imperial past, which there are not that many empires around, uh, around the world, is, uh, is very useful for the type of reasons that I just uh, uh, mentioned. And also so far, um, basically really two empires, the French Empire and the uh, British Empire have uh, taken 90% of the research, relatively little done outside of, uh, of that. So just adding another uh, historical um, group of uh, countries, uh, regions with their, with their economic as well as institutional development in itself is, uh, is quite useful. The second point is that uh, the Russian Empire, unlike uh, uh, some of the other shorter lived uh, empires because of its geography, uh, provides uh, quite a lot of variety in terms of uh, ethnicity, in terms of culture, which allows you to test a number of hypotheses if you're thinking in terms of regression analysis you have uh, a number of ways in, you, in which you can control for the influence of culture, the influence of uh, different uh, ethnicities, uh, the influence of different uh, regional variation and, uh, uh, and uh, so on. And while this so far has also been done in some of the other work uh, that you may be familiar work by Darono Semoglu for example and colleagues uh, mostly working on the British uh, Empire, some of my own work with Professor Andrei Schleifer at, um, uh, at uh, Harvard. While there is a lot of variation in these empires, in some sense the variation is too large. So you're comparing a fairly advanced at the time country, France for example, with a fairly underdeveloped uh, um, country or region economically at least, as in the Afri African colonies. So the comparisons uh, uh, become difficult in some cases to, um, to be uh, useful in discussing institutional uh, design. In the case of the Russian Empire, uh, this is not the case. So in some sense, the, there is, while there is a lot of variation, there is also a lot of similarity, partly because of the geography uh, that uh, largely continues, uh, partly just for the level of development uh, of, uh, of uh, the empire. So the only other empire that is like that is actually the, Austro the Habsburg Austro-Hungarian Empire which lasted however for not such a long time but because it was also fairly concentrated so there are some studies that have been done in economics as well as in um, political science that compare the different parts of the uh, Habsburg Empire and uh, try to draw on this uh, data some um, implications on economic uh, growth, on uh, regional growth, on uh, the influence of politics on economics and the other way uh, around. The third example which probably fortunately or unfortunately uh, economic history in Russia and this region is very uh, rich with is uh, many so-called by economists natural experiments or if you like structural breaks where society or the economy are developing in a particular way and suddenly there is a very big difference. All of a sudden something uh, shocks the system and it's not the same as it was uh, before. So I've given some um, examples here, there are many others. Um, the, evolu the evolution of serfdom is one. I've given here agrarian reforms under Stolipin, the October Revolution, the new economic, uh, the NEP. Um, deportations are somewhat different uh, uh, type of uh, 
uh, break, but it's the break of uh, either families or ethnicities uh, moving, forced to move from one, uh, from one location or another. And what does this mean for the fabric of society? How does society change if you all of a sudden move a large group of people from one place to, uh, uh, to another? And I also mentioned this is a feature of, uh, of uh, most empires. Uh, in order to control their population, to collect taxes and so on, empires tend to have a lot better statistical uh, data than uh, countries that have not been part of, uh, part of an empire. Um, so I think this so far has been relatively obvious to most. Uh, I think what's more contestable is, is this really an open area for research? Because uh, Certainly, a lot has been uh, written, especially by historians, on um, Russian history. It's linked to economics and different uh, parts of the Russian economic uh, history. For example, the new economic policy, um, uh, the NEP uh, period, uh, of what it involved, how it came about, who was for, who was against among the political leaders, what it transpired uh, uh, to and then what followed uh, after, after that. So there is actually a lot of, I think historians have done quite a lot of work uh, uh, in that. Much of it is in Russian, so it's not uh, accessible to the wider uh, research, uh, uh, research group. But much of what is written either in Russian or in English is, uh, is sort of written as not exactly storytelling, but basically just telling the facts and perhaps giving some interpretation of how these facts came about. Uh, so what is missing uh, and what is the open area of this is coming from different perspectives, so not just historians writing, but bringing economists in this particular case and trying to find out, so why did it happen exactly that way, not some other way, what was the discussion of uh, the particular ideas, uh, why a particular idea prevailed, and what was the influence of this idea, not just on the particular policy, collectivization, for example, or um, the nationalization of, um, of the small and medium businesses and, uh, after the uh, new economic policy, but what is the influence on other, uh, or other parts of society? So the fact that you have collectivization, what does it mean later on for how society, uh, society uh, works? Uh, and of course, we, are, we as economists are mostly interested on the, both the short-term economic growth and the longer-term um, economic growth. Uh, but the fourth uh, link is one that more and more I see uh, attempts uh, to draw it. I can call it um, Kondratiev's long-run uh, economic cycles or political cycles, however you want to call it. Does history repeat? And if we generally agree that history does repeat, uh, maybe sometimes we don't want it to repeat, but it does. But when it does, what are the um, parts of this repetition that are maintained? What are the parts that change over time? How often does it, uh, uh, how often does it uh, repeat? So at the extreme, this is now not research, this is uh, a hypothesis for research, is the concentration of certain sectors of the economy now in the last decade in uh, Russia, say in the financial sector, in the uh, uh, oil and gas sector that we've observed, uh, uh, let's say, in the, in the last decade, after a decade or 15 years of deconcentration, so things being privatized, going to uh, uh, to different uh, hands. Is this uh, sort of a random event, if you like? Is this just uh, several years of, um, for one reason or another, this is how economic policy goes? Or is this something that actually Russia has experienced in the past? And of course, everybody can point out immediately to um, roughly the period after the new economic policy that this is exactly what was happening uh, uh, then as well. Different way, of course, but uh, in some sectors, certainly similar outcomes. But has it happened before as well? And if you interpret uh, Russian history in particular ways, you po probably see that that has occurred at least once or twice in the early uh, Russian Empire, uh, Empire history. What does this tell us? Well, it tells, it tells us many things, but uh, among them it tells us that some institutions 
are quite sticky. So something that has prevailed in society for a long time, even if the outside world changes, even if um, uh, the political system changes to a large extent or to a small extent, there is a pervasiveness in some type of, uh, of institutions. Another word of saying for people like myself for a short time that have tried to reform institutions in our own countries, maybe some institutions are extremely difficult to reform and no matter what we try, um, uh, it's, uh, it's near impossible. So I'll show you one example with privatization. Why the privatizations that uh, in the early 90s uh, Chubayas and his team were doing and were wildly unpopular and were thought to be unpopular largely because of the bad way in which these privatizations were done. If you go back in history to Stolypin's time, when there was a very similar experiment uh, with uh, essentially privatization of agricultural land. It wasn't called privatization, but it resulted in uh, effective privatization of some agricultural land. had exactly the same effect. And in the regions where people were most unhappy with um, Stolypin's reform 110, 15 years ago, uh, then 15 years or 10 years, uh, uh, in the past, so during the reforms uh, in the 90s, exactly the same regions had exactly the same views on how privatization, now not of uh, land, but of uh, enterprises, was a bad thing, a good thing, and so on. So over a 110-year period, remarkable stickiness, and which regions in Russia thought that privatization, broadly speaking, was a good thing, and which regions thought that privatization was a bad thing. Uh, and uh, using some very basic data, you can roughly calculate uh, what was due, if you like, the dislike of privatization. How much of it is due, due to the particular policies of the Chubayas uh, group of reformers and what is hysteresis. So regardless of what they would have done, even if you have put the most popular people doing the most popular ways of uh, reforms, a given share of the population would have been uh, firmly against it. I should just mention in passing that just over the last two or three months we have started establishing a joint lab with the High School of Economics. Since it has more historians than we have, we have zero, so one can improve easily on, uh, on that. But you have uh, in this uh, field a lot of um, uh, work as well, so one of the motivations for me coming here is to try to see in which areas we can do uh, joint, uh, joint research. So I'll quickly go through four examples just to get to give you an idea of the type of uh, analysis that we've been doing. And this is just over the last four or five months of these are very recent working papers. One topic I've already mentioned, so this is the land tenure system under Prime Minister Stolipin, 1905, 1906, uh, late imperial uh, Russia, two of our professors, uh, Paul Dow and Andrei Markevich. Uh, and it goes, I'm grossly simplifying, so the historian shouldn't be too upset with me. Or if you are, don't show it. Um, so there is a lot of uh, peasant unrest starting in about 1903, 1904, 1905. It's quite obvious that this is starting to um, um, spill over, if you like, and hence, uh, a desire to do something about it. Stolypin at the time uh, Prime Minister suggested in 1906 to um, do a reform that roughly speaking allows peasants to obtain land titles. Until then the prevailing uh, way of ownership uh, of agricultural land is communal. So the whole village basically together um, owns the land that they, uh, or community, it doesn't have to be village, but the whole community together. Uh, owns the land. So essentially the uh, reform did two things. It allowed people uh, in some regions more than others, but I'm disregarding this uh, uh, for today's presentation, to basically opt out of the commune. And if they opted out of the commune, they could take with them the land that somehow uh, could be um, uh, divided and uh, as a percentage of the overall commune of the population uh, belongs or can be attributed to this family. So they could take effectively out a share of the land and obtain a title for it. But also, uh, sort of as a second uh, part of uh, 
uh, of the reform, it was possible not only to obtain some land, but to try to, after that, consolidate it into a bigger, uh, uh, bigger continuous uh, land so that it can be more easily um, uh, worked, uh, worked on. Uh, and this was done, again, in some regions more than others, but generally was a feature of this, uh, of this reform. At the time, the logic of doing this is that uh, basically peasants would be happy if they obtained some um, uh, property rights. And actually, basic economic theory would tell you that that's exactly what should happen. The moment you have stronger property rights, uh, basically you should uh, operate more efficiently, so productivity should uh, increase. And this was the logic of the reform. You increase productivity, peasants get richer. As a result, they don't uh, complain as, uh, uh, as much. If you then just, and there's a lot of data on who got what, how long it took, uh, and, uh, and so on. And I show you in uh, item four the results. So about, at the time, there were 12,700,000 uh, families who were part of this, uh, who were registered as part of the communes. So let's say 13 million uh, households. So this 13 million households, two and a half million households, exited the commune, so they basically took, um, uh, took part of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, reform. Um, and then the question is, and this was over a very short period, three, four, five years. By uh, 1909, this was uh, essentially uh, a, finished, uh, a finished process. About half of them also consolidated plots of, uh, of, uh, of land. So notice that two and a half million households participate in the reforms, exit the communes. Of them, for one reason or another, maybe they had less land, maybe uh, consolidation was made more difficult by local governments, which under certain conditions we know it was uh, the case. About half of these uh, households also managed to combine the different land plots that they received into something bigger, easier to um, cultivate. And then the question is, so these are the historical facts history ends here. Um, then an economist comes in, or a set of economists, and says, so what happened? The reform was supposed to increase agricultural productivity. So let's just test, did it or did it not increase agricultural productivity? So you do a standard productivity analysis and find that actually did not increase agricultural productivity. Productivity, in fact, on aggregate, went down. So if you look at other studies on, on property rights, that doesn't make sense, right? If you give more property rights and more certainty uh, in property rights to people, they should actually have higher productivity because in this case, uh, whatever they produce goes directly to, um, to them. So why is, that, uh, why is that the case? Then there is also a separation of this aggregate result into a discussion of let's look at productivity due to exits of co from communes and productivity due to consolidation. And I guess I've been leading you in this, uh, in this direction, but uh, what happens is that uh, exit from communes is actually associated with significantly lower land productivity. So on average, uh, in the regions that uh, saw a lot of exit from the communes, land productivity was reduced relative to the one standard deviation by 2.2%. Uh, but consolidation, knowing now that uh, some people or a lot of people exited and some of them managed to consolidate, about half or less, consolidation actually is associated with higher land productivity. So one part of the policy, the bigger part, did not work or worked in the negative direction. The smaller part, the consolidations, worked in the positive direction. One way to say this is that if everybody wanted to exit and then everybody consolidated, and they were regulatory, it was not just that people didn't want to consolidate. Many people wanted but were not allowed by the local governments who had a say in this. Overall productivity would have actually been increased quite substantially by about four percentage points uh, a year. But since a number of people were not allowed uh, households to consolidate, the first result, the exit, dominates the second uh, uh, result overall and you end up with uh, a negative effect from, um, from the overall uh, reform. 
Now, why is that? Why is the first result uh, negatively associated? As I mentioned, just if you think of property rights, it shouldn't. Well, what happened is that a lot of families exited thinking that they'll be able to consolidate, have higher productivity, become richer. For regulatory reasons, local government regulatory reasons, they couldn't consolidate. They struggled for one, two, three years. This happened to be also a difficult period in, uh, uh, in agriculture, and basically they were not, success not successful. At that time, they were also outside of the communes, so they don't have a security blanket, if you like. So many of these people had no choice but basically to leave the uh, villages and go to the, to the cities. Um, basically leave uh, their main until then uh, productive activity and try to look for work and for um, livelihood in the, uh, in the industrial uh, cities. So as a result, you suddenly ended up with a lot of uh, exit, but complete exit from agriculture and moving to um, uh, moving to the cities. And this is why the overall picture on, uh, on uh, productivity in agriculture ended up being negative, not like what Stolipin and people uh, around him uh, wanted uh, to do. The paper ends with this question. So these people moved to the cities, but they're not happy movers. They didn't really want to move, or at least many of them didn't really want to be in the cities. They just didn't have livelihood in the villages that they uh, uh, started from, from, so around 1909, 1910, 1911, you can also see in the migration data that suddenly a lot of, well, data doesn't say that they're unhappy, but they seem to be unhappy because of their economic conditions. Suddenly a lot of unhappy people move to the cities. The question that uh, we leave, it's for uh, different studies, has this contributed significantly to five years later having the October, October Revolution. Historians need to answer that question. Second example. The examples are not necessarily related. I'm giving you different examples on, um, on purpose. Stalin's deportations. I already mentioned uh, that uh, topic where historians have done an excellent job. We have very good data, very good descriptions. Um, maps of who moved where, I'll show you one in a, in a moment. So the history part of science has done a very good job. Uh, economists have done nothing basically to, um, to date. So this is a paper but by a former student of ours who is now a PhD at Duke University that basically goes like this. How many people were deported? About 2.8 million people were deported to Siberia and Central Asia in a very short period of time. Um, this was done uh, just uh, around, uh, just before and during the Second World War. Um, and there were about 10 different ethnic groups that were the primary targets for this, of which uh, some were uh, rehabilitated, maybe that may, meaning they're allowed to return to their original um, uh, locations already after the death of Stalin in the uh, early 50s, so basically during Khrushchev's time. But there are some ethnic groups, in particular eth ethnic Germans and Crimean Tatars, that were not rehabilitated until the 90s. So basically for a long period of 40, 50 years, they had to stay where they were um, sent uh, during um, Stalin's time. So the questions that we ask here are very simple. So given that you have this uh, people who didn't want to be a bit like the peasants, they didn't want to go to the cities but were forced to by economic reasons. Or in this case, these people were pushed not by economic reasons but by political reasons. Basically, they were just shipped to these places and not allowed to go back for uh, several uh, decades. How do they affect not their voting behavior, political behavior, but the political behavior of the whole region? And we take two different uh, cuts of, uh, of uh, time uh, periods. I'll tell you in a moment why. First, immediately after uh, the collapse of the Soviet, uh, or the possible collapse of the Soviet Union, as you know, 1991, there is a referendum on the future of the Soviet Union. A referendum is a very basic question, well, several questions, but the basic one is, do you want to live in the larger Soviet Union as it existed then? Or basically, are you going for, uh, are you fine if, uh, if there is uh, decentralization or something like, uh, like that? Um, and, and what we're asking is in the regions where these people were shipped, 
what happened in this, in this particular referendum. Was their voting behavior different than others? We also had 16 years later, 2007, there is a World Bank EBRD survey on basically trust in central authority. It asks not just in Russia, in all of the um, former socialist countries, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, former Soviet Union, it, it asks um, the same set of questions. Basically, do you trust uh, the president? Do you trust um, the republic? Do you trust parliament? Do you trust uh, the church, do you, you know, basically a number of questions on who you trust. So, you, so we take several of the questions uh, on trust in central authority, in this case mostly the president. And notice this is not just the Russian president, this is the Kazakh president by 2007, the Kyrgyz president, uh, uh, the Ukraine president, and, uh, and so on. And ask the question, uh, well, what happens then? Is this mistrust or, or uh, voting during the referendum consistent 16 years later? Why is it important 16 years later? Because if in 1991 you can argue that the uh, uh, ethnic Germans, for example, uh, were still in this location, so, so in some sense voting was by them or their descendants and everybody else, but they could have, in some sense, met in groups and said, vote against the central authority. By 2007, we have other data that we uh, show on migration that basically shows that the vast majority of ethnic Germans have left already Kazakhstan, Russia, and so on. They went back to, uh, uh, to Germany, some to other countries. So by 2007, who is voting is not the Germans. It's not their, uh, their family, their uh, kids and so on, is basically the people who were their neighbors, colleagues, uh, and so on. What happens, it's not, uh, it's not uh, probably surprising. Well, first let me show you the deportations by um, numbers. Probably you don't see that. But lots of people were shipped to Siberia, lots of people were shipped to Central Asia. So that's why you have a lot in Kazakhstan, a lot in the Kyrgyz uh, Republic, some in uh, Armenia, some in uh, what's present day uh, uh, Georgia, and they're mostly shipped from basically this part of the country, so the, the bigger industrial, uh, industrial areas. Uh, but the point of this is that we have very, very good uh, uh, data on, uh, on uh, deportations over many years, who were shipped how, we have very complete uh, descriptions of the families and so on, can be used for, for other research. So what happens? Well, deported regions were not happy with, uh, basically didn't want to be part of the Soviet Union. So they were consistently voting uh, against uh, keeping the Soviet Union um, together. So I've shown you here the elasticities basically. So if you have 1% more deported uh, people, the votes in favor of the Soviet Union decrease by three quarters of a percentage point. So very significant, especially in some areas where lots of people were uh, were um, shipped. More interesting though is what happened 16 years later, so 2007. When you ask the question, do you trust the president, basically the central authority, and this question is asked in several ways, so it's not just, uh, uh, just a simple question, we can cross-check it, that they've understood it well. The effect is even bigger, so 1% uh, higher deportations to a particular uh, region, decreases the percentage of trust in the president by full five percentage points. Both results are interesting. The first is, however, intuitive, I would say. It's just useful to have it for further research. The second one is not intuitive, um, at least in my mind. Um, and the magnitude of it is especially not intuitive. It basically says not only the Germans and the Tatars and some of the other, there were some smaller ethnic groups that were deported, were unhappy with central authority and many years after that uh, felt that, uh, that there should be less uh, power and less trust in this. But even when they left the regions that they were, even the people who were most affected by this were not, uh, were not there. The rest of the population, which was not directly affected by the bad, uh, consequences of uh, deportation still voted consistently and actually with an incre increasing degree uh, against, uh, against uh, central uh, authority. What does this tell you? Well, this result can be used in a number of ways uh, in both uh, 
discussing how beliefs spread, how trust spreads in, uh, uh, in a society, but also the longer run effect. So you do something in 1941, 42, 43, and so on, and then you have 65 years later, or 60 years later, you have a result that's actually very support, uh, very uh, important on the way that people uh, vote. And in these countries, and in general in the world, one can then make the link from politics to economics and say, who, whoever is the president uh, supposedly influences economic policy as well, so we care very much uh, if people voted one way or another. In the next presentation, I'll show you an even more uh, specific example of, uh, of that. We have just two more examples and then we can talk. So this is a different variation on the same topic. Now people send to gulags. I don't mean to be very negative, on the, especially on Friday uh, evening, but um, these are the type of experiments that few other countries have, and at least not at that, uh, at that massive scale. So what's the history uh, uh, here? Um, it, doesn't it doesn't start only in 29, there were gulags before 29, but middle of 29 there is a decree by Stalin uh, on the use of labor of convicted criminals. And then basically it lists that almost everybody could be a, conf uh, uh, a convicted criminal. And you see how quickly the numbers rise. So there were about 180,000 gulag prisoners in 1930. By the end of the decade there were about 2 million. By 1951, there were 2.5 million, which was two and a half, three percent of the overall population of, uh, of Russia. Um, I can test you if you know how many prisoners are now in Russia, but we can leave it for, um, for later. But there are a lot fewer than uh, there were in um, 51, just in the gulags. And there are about 160 um, uh, gulags during the time. So we do a very similar experiment, but now with voting for the presidential elections in 1996. You remember, well, many of you maybe don't remember, and I don't, but I've read about it. The 1996 presidential elections in Russia were arguably the most important so far, um, because there was a clear choice between a communist who was saying we're getting back to where we were several years uh, ago, and then President Yeltsin, uh, who was arguably going towards a market economy and um, a variation of democracy. So, um, so the question is, uh, let's see the regions where the gulags uh, were, uh, were mostly. Nin by 1996, notice the gulags, their height was 51-52. Once Stalin died, they started going down, down, down. And by about 65 or so, there are very few gulags left. So there is basically a difference between, let's say, 65 and 1996, about 30 years in which people were not in gulags. They could have moved. They didn't have uh, obligation to stay in this, uh, uh, in these places. So again, like in the previous article, it's not necessarily that the prisoners or the ex-prisoners are voting against, um, uh, in this case, the communist uh, uh, candidate, it is the general population in this uh, region that uh, expresses a particular preference. Okay, this is not very well seen, um, but basically uh, what it shows is that unlike the previous picture on, um, uh, on the ethnic uh, deportations, most of the gulags were actually around Moscow, ally, uh, uh, around uh, relatively well-developed industrial areas. Why? Because the Gulag prisoners were mostly used basically as free labor to boost uh, industrial activity, partic particularly during, uh, and during and after the Second World, uh, uh, World uh, War. So how did the presidential election uh, go? Um, well, the question was, remember, is it Zhuganov the communist candidate or is it uh, President Yeltsin for a second uh, uh, term? In the uh, paper, it describes a lot more region by, uh, uh, by region, but you can roughly see here that the darker it is, the more people vote communist, and the lighter it is, the less people uh, vote communist. And with the black dots, you see where the, the 158 gulags were. 
and then we have population, we have wages, we have all the standard uh, control variables to make sure that the voting is not due to the fact that these regions are somehow poorer or richer, more educated, less educated, more women, less women, and so on, all of this is controlled for. So what happens as a result? Well, we show that whatever in the past 30, 40 years, in the past there was a Gulag uh, camp, the particular uh, region that is uh, voting, um, that cut the share for Zhuganov of voters, the communist uh, vote, by about two percentage points. How important is two percentage points? Well, Yeltsin won, he had 54.4 altogether, so basically he, he had four and a half percent more than, uh, than, uh, than uh, the half of uh, voting that, uh, that uh, he needed to, to become uh, president. Essentially half of this effect is due to the presence of gulags in particular, in particular regions. So you can say that it was his personal uh, character, it was the campaign that he ran, and so on, and certainly that is a big part of it, but actually a very significant in terms of the relative share of the difference that, that made the, the vote can be explained by, by factors that have nothing to do with, uh, with uh, Yeltsin. Um, why is that important? So you can say, well, that's political science, we shouldn't care that much about, uh, about that. Well, the question, just like in the previous uh, uh, paper, the question that is left for political scientists maybe, or for historians as well, is to say, had Zhuganov become the president in 1996, would Russia, not just Russia, but a lot of Central and Eastern Europe, would, would it be radically different? I cannot answer that question, but people at least can have um, entertaining discussions on, them, on, on that. And the final example goes back in time. It's a completely different uh, example. Governors in Tsarist Russia, and this is late Tsarist, uh, uh, Tsarist uh, Russia, 1985 to 1914, just before the, the revolution. So the question here is uh, quite different. We know who these governors are. Again, historians have done a very good job basically tracking them, where they come from, what they studied, how wealthy is their family, what did they do before they become uh, governors, and so on. Uh, and we want to basically track now these governors for a period of about uh, 10 years, but knowing their characteristics at the very beginning of the period as well, to see what happens to them. In particular, do they get promoted? And at that time, the height of promotion is if you go from anywhere else in Russia to St. Petersburg. So being in St. Petersburg was like the best thing that you could uh, do in terms of um, promotion, uh, and in particular if you could get to the state council or the senate, become a, a senator, that was the usual promotion strategy for um, the Tsar promoting uh, uh, regional governors. Um, so the question is who gets promoted? Is there a pattern to it or is it basically who knows uh, that the family, the imperial family, or has some other connections, or is wealthy, bribes himself into into uh, promotion to St. Petersburg and so on. Can you basically catch some characteristics of the careers? So we look at something which at the first pass looks like not economic uh, variable, but in fact one can argue is the intensity of peasant revolts and worker strikes in the particular oblasts or regions where these governors were uh, ruling. Why are we looking at that? Because if you have uh, either peasant revolts or worker strikes, first that means that there is some dispute between, roughly speaking, labor and capital, uh, but also because that dispute is, a, is likely to have a negative effect on economic growth, economic productivity, so that region somehow is not working, the economy is not working um, uh, well. And what we are looking at in the particular tenure of the governors in these different uh, provinces, essentially how many revolts and worker strikes they were, how long did they last, what do the governors do to essentially subdue them. Uh, and then link this and many other variables, who knew who, who was third cousin to the Tsar, who was 15th cousin to the Tsar, and so on, to see whether it's related somehow to um, uh, nepotism, corruption, and, uh, and so on. What do we find? Well, we find the result here is on, uh, on uh, 
the fourth uh, line. Basically, that governors that successfully dealt with revolts, successful means here we do not pick the ways with which they did it, so how uh, harsh or not they were, but how quickly they dealt with this, dealt with uh, uh, peasant revolts and worker strikes, and also just how long these strikes or revolts continued. So the shorter the duration, the governors must have uh, dealt with them uh, with them in a more expedient and uh, efficient uh, fashion. What happens? So governors that deal with uh, uh, revol uh, revolts successfully basically have three times larger chance of promotion uh, in the ten in the after the term. Uh, in, uh, in uh, the particular uh, region. So it seems that uh, maybe there are some other factors that uh, had an effect, certainly there are other factors that had an effect on promotions. But the way that you dealt with, uh, with revolts, which also had an impact, we show in the paper on uh, economic uh, uh, productivity and so on, also had a fairly substantial effect. Why is that an important result? Well, at the first pass, it's not actually a very important result, except that uh, when you discuss present-day China and reforms in present-day China, you would get both from academics, from researchers, but also the official sort of policy of the Chinese government is to say, well, we have a managed economy. We don't like a market economy the way that it's in the West. Uh, and we certainly don't like a democratic regime the way that it's in the West, but what we do have in China that promotes our economic growth is competition across regions. So basically we make our governors and regions compete, and the regions that have the highest successes in infrastructure development, in uh, economic growth, we promote their governors to come to Beijing and become part of the Central Committee, and then we give more resources to this uh, uh, regions and there have been lots of academics saying well that may work in China because it's a particular culture but that's not going to work in any other country because other countries are not so disciplined and don't have the treatment that uh, you may end up having in um, China for example executions of, uh, of governors. Well you see a very different uh, time hundred years ago no executions of governors um, uh, at the time, at least not for this reason, um, of, bad, uh, of bad governing, but still very similar results. Even 100 years ago under Tsarist Russia, there was some attempt to reward uh, successful governors uh, relative to not successful ones in terms of uh, preventing uh, labor capital disputes. Uh, sorry. And the last one to conclude is uh, to go back, what do these different examples show? Well, one thing that I haven't shown much here, but actually from each of these studies you can have uh, uh, the effect as an indirect effect is, what is the effect of different reforms or different changes, structural changes on economic growth? Economists mostly uh, worry about, uh, about this. But you can also go answering that question in a much more complete fashion by, by not just saying this happened and this was the effect on economic productivity, on economic uh, growth, but what is the channel through which uh, it affected economic growth. Uh, and most of the examples that I uh, gave you are like that. So we want to see something happens, there is an institutional choice by the government or by the peasants in one uh, case, but again following uh, uh, a decision by Stolypin's uh, government. What is the effect on the political outcomes as well after that? And then how these political outcomes affect institutions sometime a few years after that, sometimes decades uh, after that. So two examples that I, uh, uh, that I showed you uh, go into this, uh, into this category. I also mentioned one example, not in these papers, it's an earlier paper. But basically looks at Stolypin's reform and looks at, I mentioned, in which regions, oblasts of Russia, there were the most strikes against his reform. So basically peasants were not happy to, to, to sort of take land in their own uh, hands. And then uh, the authors do a simple mapping, if you like, just a correlation to say which were the regions that were anti-reform 1906 and which were the regions that were anti-reform in 1994, 1995 when the, uh, basically the big privatization round was, uh, 
what's happening. And the mapping is, uh, is, uh, is very exact. So it basically says that about a third of the attitudes against privatization in uh, the, mid, uh, the early to mid 90s were due to attitudes, or if you like, uh, trust or mistrust uh, that uh, was uh, piling up about 80 to 90 years uh, before that. Why is this important and why is both the second and the third point important? And I'll finish with this. Well, because ultimately this tells you in the longer run, not year to year, what is the likely economic path of a particular country. So what else we may expect from the Russian economy, both in terms of performance, but also in terms of structure, five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe 50, 50 years uh, from uh, now. History repeats, sometimes in partial ways, but if we're able to capture some of this uh, partial ways as this, uh, as this papers do. And then especially if you have more and more studies that look at uh, the same issues from different perspectives, you can pretty much have a mapping, a picture that's, that says the Chinese society is specific in these particular ways, but some of it can be translated to other countries as well. Some of it is indeed culture specific or society uh, specific. The Russian society is specific in this way, but everything else is exactly like you would have it in other empires, in other, in other institutional uh, setups, and hence some reforms have a chance of success. Some reforms you hope that they have a chance of success, but history is very much against you. The population uh, uh, has, has basically uh, a distrust of particular types of uh, reforms, and as a result, they are very likely to happen in uh, not just uh, democratic societies, but in any kind of uh, in any kind of society. I'll stop here. If we have questions. Well, questions, colleagues. Any question? Um, if I may. So, uh, um, am I correct to understand that the main uh, problem of uh, these uh, research projects are the, is the problem of correlation and also measurings of factors, what matters, right? And uh, that's also very much about mapping, except maybe the last, no, or the last or, or, or also. Well, I, I'm very much uh, interested and persuaded by the last project, I mean, uh, careers. I think some historians did something, I mean, uh, studying bureaucracy and factors influenced, uh, so doing in, in a more, t more traditional level. But I have, speaking frankly, some reservations concerning other projects. So I, I, I'm not a specialist in the field of Stalipin reform, but my feeling of Stalipin reform that national level is absolutely misleading. So, uh, I mean, Stalipin reform was very uh, different in uh, different provinces for different reasons. So, so any generalization, uh, generalization is misleading. Mm -hmm. While well, speaking about these two projects, uh, project, the impact of repressions over political behavior uh, at the end of the um, 20th and 21st centuries, maybe that's, that's a wrong correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. so. To study just one factor, it could be a, a wrong correlation. For what reason? I, I think ethnic is an important, ethnic factor is important, urbanization is extremely important, and to my knowledge, uh, the most um, uh, anti communist or pro Yeltsin places in, in Russia were like St. Petersburg, Moscow, which were not definitely places of Gulag. Mm -hmm. Ural, which to some extent partially was and partially wasn't. Uh, and uh, I, I have actually absolutely different mapping uh, of uh, this um, situation because uh, at that very time I was deeply impressed how much uh, we have the same map <coughs> as at 1917. Mm -hmm. So the areas voted for the Bolsheviks uh, to Russian Constitutional Assembly were Petrograd, Moscow, Central Industrial Area, and Ural and Baltic Fleet, right? Everything except Baltic Fleet 
yes. Yeltsin base of support. I mean, so factors of urbanization, a kind of special political experience, could be much more important than the, the factor of, of, of repression. I'm not sure I'm a specialist also in this field, but, but I think you should have a kind of uh, expertise. And actually, my understanding is that in reality, Zuganov got majority. So there was a kind of game behind it. So also one important figure who counted this vote in what area. So what was political resource of central government in this situation, which was much more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, well, so we're at the beginning of this research. So in some sense, this is when you present so that uh, you can uh, improve your hypothesis. So on Stolypin's reform, it's true that the aggregate does not uh, uh, correlate with, well with what happened uh, region by region. So in some regions, uh, reform was, uh, the agricultural reform was very successful. But we know the, region, the, the reason, or at least the channel for which, because if both people were allowed, households were allowed to separate from the commune, and they were allowed to aggregate land, to, to, and we know it's not this region allowed, this didn't, but there are whole areas, uh, sets of uh, oblasts where it was allowed by the local uh, governments and uh, people basically in the cadaster who were supposed to write this were actively helping uh, basically the reform. While there are other parts of uh, the country, and it probably correlates well with the geography that you showed that it was the opposite. The local governments were trying to prevent as hard as possible people to uh, exit the commune, and certainly through the cadastre, they are not allowing them to aggregate uh, land. So there is a pattern region by, uh, uh, by region, which is quite, uh, quite uh, different. But I think the overall effect uh, is interesting, not as an economic effect at the aggregate level, but as the effect of migration. So suddenly you had a lot of people who, within a period of three, four, five years, had one set of expectations. These expectations did not work out, and they were forced to go to the urban areas. Uh, and if you have a large inflow of people to urban areas, if the industry is developing well, maybe this is a seamless process, like we see now in, uh, or have seen over the last decade or so, two decades in China. If the industrial sector is not ready to have this big inflow of uh, potential new workers, well, then it stirs uh, political uh, movement, political, uh, political uh, uh, revolt. I'm not saying that it's because of this peasant that uh, the October Revolution uh, started. There were many other reasons uh, behind it. But probably it helped quite a lot that you had a, a, a large other group, uh, not just the workers and, uh, and the army, but a large other group of people who for different set of reasons were also not happy uh, supporting the old, uh, the old regime. And from there you need to have a leap, not by economists, but maybe by historians and political scientists to say, so what if let's say the October Revolution, well, you're an expert uh, on this, so what if the October Revolution did not happen, or did not happen in that particular um, way? Would Russia have been different? The economy certainly would have been different. There are a number of good economic studies that basically say after the October Revolution, partly because of the experimentation with uh, economic policy for the next decade or decade and a half, the long-term growth path of Russia was reduced very substantially. So it did not get to the pre-revolution uh, pre, uh, uh, growth path for a very long time, two decades, three decades, something like that. So it clearly the revolution had a big effect on, uh, on the economy. And from there, we are in a different uh, political uh, realm. As to the repressions, the gulags, and so on, I think the first order effect is clearly what you say. So based, it's not just urban. Urban, well-educated, somewhat wealthier because of that, perhaps, uh, people, both in Russia, but actually remarkably across most countries in the, in the world, tend to vote not necessarily anti-communist, but anti-pro-democracy, uh, sort of pro-market. Um, uh, the same, since I'm quite familiar with uh, voting patterns in, in my own country, in uh, Bulgaria, typically the center-right takes all the large cities, and typically the old communists, now called socialists, take the villages. 
been 25 years and the same pattern continues to go uh, for 25, um, uh, 25 uh, years. So I think this is the first order effect. What we are finding is basically a second order effect or maybe even a third order effect. But given that, and we control for this, for geography, for um, education, for family income, uh, income of the voters and so on, is there another effect? And we find this effect that given that St. Petersburg, Moscow and so on um, voted primarily for Yeltsin, also, on top of it, there were regions that uh, that were voting more for Yeltsin. Let's say, let's say that way, uh, relative to what we would have um, we would have expected, and and that effect, to some extent, is irrespective of whether there was a lot of uh, forging of the results, because as long as the forging was happening relatively consistently, you're saying that maybe it wasn't happening relatively consistently, then the same result would carry through. It's a second order effect, that's why I showed it. It's, I think Yeltsin won 54.4, but Juganov didn't win 46, he won 37, I believe. So there was a substantial gap between them. But uh, these two percentage points were maybe, what, a tenth of the gap? A bit less, an eighth of the gap. Still relatively important in uh, in economic uh, terms. But what we are missing with this, so we have, uh, I showed you four papers. We by now, over the course of last year, have produced maybe a dozen papers. Two or three of them are already published, or about to be actually published next, uh, next month. But to have a full map, and you're right about this, what at least I view this research is provide a map of how over time Russian institutions have developed consistently or not consistently with the type of institutions that in similar other countries we would have expected to, uh, uh, to develop and we have seen to develop. And if the institutions are roughly uh, the same type of uh, development, for uh, for policymakers, maybe that's useful. For researchers, it's not so useful. But if the uh, some parts of the institutions are developing in a very different way from what we would expect in similar type in terms of economic growth and other um, geography and so on countries, so that tells you that there is something specific about Russia and not Russia the way that it is now. You can say Russian culture, Russian policy making. Uh, Russian institutions that uh, we need to identify better and then to learn that specific thing or set of uh, things and we're not there yet I think you need to do dozens of papers to get to that uh, to that uh, point and also over different periods of time to see whether what we see in Tsarist Russia you see um, uh, after the revolution you see after Stalin you see after the during the democratic period, whether there is something that carries through regardless of the political system in place. Other questions? More questions at many, maybe comments? Okay, so I think we must thank, thank Simeon for his presentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.